All right, for our study on character qualities of a good leader, today's character quality is gracious or graciousness. All right? Leaders need to be gracious. Students will expect much from you. Show them a gracious spirit and service, and they will tend to become more gracious and thankful themselves. Remember, none of these qualities is you do this, they will do, right? These are qualities, character qualities of leaders that when we model and live these things out, being more like Christ, our students should in turn follow our lead. All right, let's look at the Bible verse here today from Luke. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So we're looking at these character qualities. We're looking at the life of Christ. We're trying to see what it looks like for us, not only as leaders here and in our lives, but also as teachers. Graciousness comes from our Father as a model for us to be for those around us. So let's think about a classroom setting with graciousness. Can anybody think of times or situations in a classroom where you're going to need to be gracious? Any thoughts coming to mind? Rebecca? too gracious that people can take advantage of that. So I think, like I said, there's boundaries, but like if a student had a really like emergency the night before or something with sports or mm -hmm. curricular activities, I think um, just being gracious with then like, okay, you can get it to me by the end of the day, like mm -hmm. showing grace in that sense. Mm -hmm. So instead of just absolutely not, you're willing to show graciousness in that way. So you think there's a, another side to that graciousness as well? So on Thursday, our character quality is fairness. And I would like for us to revisit this example in light of fairness as well. But I, I think this is going to come up a lot, right? Middle school, high school, do you think there are going to be students who need grace for assignments, for due dates, for tasks? What are other examples where our model of graciousness would be beneficial for our students? I'm just thinking of like bad attitudes, like when students have bad attitudes um, and just showing grace to them. I feel like that's going to be really hard, mm -hmm. so that's something you'll have to like really work on. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. That also crossed my mind. Remember, middle school, volatile. Every day, every moment, 10 minutes in, you have to be ready, right? Be ready to be gracious. What were you going to say, Ashley? Uh, I think with a lot of the case studies that we've been doing, it involves like misbehavior in some form. And I think a part of grace is first being willing to like, listen to them and hear what they have to say. So being like quick to listen and like slow to like getting angry or just being frustrated with them. Absolutely. If we just feed right into what they're already doing, then we're not helping them learn or grow in that situation, right? So being willing to wait, take a step back, show them grace, uh, patience, <laughs> um, not let your own anger rise <laughs> in some of these situations. Absolutely. I mean, these verses in Luke, and we can also find them in Matthew and um, maybe even each of the Gospels. But the opposite, I don't necessarily think of our students as our enemies. But if we're to do this for our enemies, how much more for those we already have a relationship with and are trying to build into, right? All right, any additional thoughts? Oh, Rebecca. I was, I'm just thinking about, like this summer I work as a teacher mm -hmm. um, and my boss is just really gracious and like I think being gracious provides like a safe environment and like you're willing to go the extra mile because you know like if you take a risk or make a mistake, then like, you're not going to be penalized. So I think it just allows students to feel like safe with your culture. 
Absolutely. I agree. And we've talked a lot about building a community of learners. So you want to be that safe place. Excellent example. I'm also glad you had that experience over the summer um, with a gracious leader. Any additional thoughts on being gracious, what it looks like in our classroom? All right, thank you. I do believe I forgot to bring up our case study, but let's take a quick peek at today. We're here on the 29th. Your trade book lesson plan is due today. I've scored four of them. There are four remaining, so make sure those get to me by the end of today's date. Submit those. To prepare for Thursday's class, I would like for you to read chapter 13. There isn't anything else that you have due for Thursday. We will talk about mini teaching, and we'll talk about family math night. I was able to meet with Mr. Gaynor. I've got great ideas. I think we're going to be able to make it work, and we'll talk more about that on Thursday. So any questions on what you need to do to prepare for our next class? All right, let me pull up our case studies. Sorry about that. OK, so we're just coming off of M, learning thank you for your reflections on her, what you would do. Now let's go today to D and B. All right. D are both, that should say male, not make students. They are both male students who turned 16 the summer before entering eighth grade. All right, just let that sink in a moment. They turned 16 before they entered eighth grade. Good? OK. Uh, and then I said again, because they didn't turn 16 again. They entered eighth grade again. They don't carry books. They occasionally have a pencil. D is very social and funny, but has not legitimately passed a grade since third or fourth. And he's entering eighth grade again, so keep that in mind. B is very quiet and withdrawn and has also not passed since fifth grade. Each has been retained the maximum number of times before automatic promotion to high school. You are their eighth grade mathematics teacher what do you do with D and B? So go ahead and talk amongst yourselves, get some ideas, and then we'll have the class discussion. years who's ever had them since third or fourth grade and mm -hmm. see like what they tried with the students uh, like what they um, if anything did motivate them the previous years and see if that we can right. implement also, those like discuss with parents like if, they, if their parents are around like discuss with their parents what their interests are and like possibly that'll help them get motivated if you know like if your parents tell you like what interests they have I think there's a big assumption though too that if they're if they're already not going through like if they're not making it to the next grade levels and they're not trying like in school the parents aren't um, probably participating in, in that either. That's true. So yeah. That's so generally what happens. Yeah, all right. So all right, so let's bring it together. I'm hearing snippets of conversation. I think you have a lot to say about this one. Who wants to go first? What are some of the things you talked about? What do you do with DNB? We'll start here, Isaac. Uh, I was thinking that this would probably be a good time to just have a very intentional conversation with them about what's been going on. Um, I think that'd be a good first step or a step to take in the direction because I think with these students, you are going to have to be very intentional with getting them to be motivated to do their schoolwork. 
uh, with that, I also said um, you should. Uh, Yeah, so you should, I, I say talk to the teachers from the previous school years, see like what they tried, um, where issues began, if anything motivated them, and then try to implement those into, the, um, into your classroom. So Isaac talked twice in two different ways kind of about motivating, being very intentional, that's what you guys talked about, and then also talking to other teachers to see if they did anything that worked for motivating. Okay, other ideas, what else? That at this point, if they were just taught straight through school, you know, I think it would be maybe not beneficial. So they would need at least some form of tutoring or something to aid in, like, starting with their sixth grade level of knowledge to be able to be teaching the eighth grade content. So they're possibly several grades behind? Maybe figure out where are they? Meet them where they are? If that's fifth grade, meet them at fifth grade. In your class? I don't think there would be enough time to, so you could try. Like, it, it would be a totally different, probably than the rest of the students. And then it, two of them, so that might be helpful if they both work on things. But it would probably be taking them. And they're not in the same class, I should. That's another piece of the story. They aren't in the same class. If they were, it might even be better. Then I can have maybe a small group. I can do something slightly different. Okay, tutoring. Do you think tutoring would happen after school? Or should we try tutoring while we have them there? Probably, probably would not show up. Why do you think they might not show up if we have an after school program? Because they don't participate when they're supposed to be there, so they're not going to like spend extra time. If they're not going to do what they're supposed to be doing during the school day, how am I going to expect them to put in the extra effort and do it even more? Okay. Okay. Yes, Rebecca. They obviously are not motivated by school. And, but I do think they have some interest or some motivation. So I kind of, going off what Isaac said, would have a like intentional conversation about like where are they wanting to end up in life? Like where do they want to go? And then kind of show them, okay, well this is how school is going to be important for that. And kind of show them the importance of school on like how they want to reach their dreams. Um, and like not necessarily asking them to be a genius, but like get a degree. <laughs> like we want you to get a degree. And like we were talking about how they're, he, they're in like classes with 13 year olds. Like no matter how cool they are or think they are, I know they feel embarrassed. And so like, acknowledging like, hey, I know it's no joke that, or like no secret that you're the oldest and you probably are uncomfortable with that. So how can we get you out of this so you don't have to experience this anymore? I'd be kind of blunt, honestly, I feel like. Hit it head on. What do you think about 13 year olds um, sitting next to 16 year olds in your class? What about some of your really young eighth graders who are 12? That's a pretty big difference, yes? Let's just think about boys. Think about what a 12 year old boy <laughs> looks like compared to a 16 year old boy. So talk about some embarrassment on both sides, right? This is. This is maybe difficult. It's as if middle school wasn't hard enough, now you have this huge age difference between the people you're in class with instead of the majority, you know, we're kind of all in this, we're at the same stage, things are crazy. Now we've got some 16 year olds. They could drive themselves to school. They weren't allowed, but. And some of your eighth graders are still playing with toys, right? Like big, big difference in your classroom. How you meet the needs, how you motivate, strategies you use, differentiation, do you think that's going to be part of it? What about differentiation where the oldest in the class has to do something academically lower or before some of the youngest in your class? That's going to be hard as well. Are you going to maintain motivations? 
How do you relate? You are in your first year of teaching. You're quite young, and they're 16. Are they going to maybe even challenge your authority? Think about that aspect, all right, when you're doing your reflection. What about, or what do you ask them what motivates them or what they want to do with their lives or things like that, and they have no ideas? What if they're unwilling to share? A 16-year-old, it's more likely. The younger they are, the more dreams they have. Yeah. The older, maybe if you've experienced failure after failure after failure after failure, think about that, what that does, right, to your ability to dream. So these are all factors I want you to just ponder. Start your reflections, and then Thursday in class when we do the follow-up, I'll give you some additional bits of information. There's some funny things in here, some sad or challenging things. We'll follow up on Thursday, um, but I want you to have time to reflect on what this could look like in your classroom. Think about the things that were brought up, and then the couple of points that I gave you, and then we'll revisit this on Thursday. Any more comments? We didn't hear Ash Ashley and Ilona. Did you have anything to add that was a little different from our conversation? Sorry. Um, like you can, like he obviously is not motivated, or both of them aren't motivated in school, so probably um, encouraging them to like explore career tech routes, I guess, because high school is like a big jump for that. I know he's going, they're going to eighth grade, but um, I guess just start putting those ideas, maybe um, if like in your classroom you could have the students take like personality tests or like just like start thinking about career options, I guess. Yeah. Instead of waiting till they get to the high school, <laughs> do it. They are 16, right? Absolutely. I also forgot, so add that to what you're reflecting on, and I forgot to ask you to reflect on what you think about this piece, that last sentence. They've been retained the maximum number of times before automatic promotion. Now, look, neither of them has passed a grade since at least fifth. D, it was third or fourth. Uh, but then they're going to be automatically promoted. So they don't have to show that they can pass academically the skills, the standards, the content, but they're going on. So reflect a little bit about what you think of that. Okay? All right, anything else from our case study? All right. I'm going to mute this. You were asked to bring your trade books to class today. I want each of you to show them to us. You are not going through your entire lesson plan, but... Instead of just you learning about your specific book by all of us sharing, you walk away with seven additional ideas of books you could use in your middle school classroom for teaching more than one content area. So this is an integrated project. As you're sharing, here's what I want you to say. I want you to just give us, show us your book, right? What is it about very generally? We're talking just a couple of minutes here just to show us. And then what three content areas? We already know math, but what specifically? We know language arts, what specifically? And then you tell us that third content, whether it's science, social studies, or multicultural. All right? Then we walk away with those ideas. We can add it to our list of resources. All right? I have no specific order, so how about we just start at the front, move back, and then end with the two of you? Does that work? Okay. Rebecca, you want to start first? So I think we've all seen this book. Yeah. Um, I had my teacher read this to me and I absolutely loved it. It is Circumference and the Dragon of Pi. And I saw many, many ways that you could like use this book to, um, as an activity in the classroom. But the way that I, well also I want to show this one page. Um, there's also a lot of math content in here. So like for example, you could use this page and it has like a little riddle about circles, and I'm gonna read it real quick. It says, measure the middle and circle around, divide so a number can be found. Every circle, great and small, the number is the same for all. It's also the dose, so be clever, or a dragon, you will stay forever. So basically, the sun has to figure out this riddle about circles and circumferences and diameters um, to save his dad. Um, so for my lesson, I am going to read the book, and then ask them, like, what's some math language that you heard in here? And then 
I'm hoping they'll say circumference or diameter, explain what that is, and then we're gonna do an activity where they get divided up into groups, they have circular objects, and they're going to um, use a ruler to measure the diameter, the radius, the circumference. I'm gonna ask, how do you think you can measure their circumference? Someone might say a string, and so then I'm going to hand out string, and they're going to like take the string, wrap it around the circle, pinch it, and then measure it. Are you guys following my, okay. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the activity for the math. But then I thought it would be helpful to reread the story again um, after they review the math concept and kind of like see how what they've learned was implemented in the book. Because after I read it a second time after reviewing the terms myself, I kind of it made sense a little bit more. Um, but also after reading it for the second time, I'm going to ask them, what's the setting? What is uh, the story about? Um, and then that's how we're going to get into like the historical part of the book. And I'm hoping they'll say like, well, there is a king and queen. Oh, what type of government is that? A monarchy. Um, and so then the last activity will be for them to write an own s mathematical story, including like the setting as a monarchy. Um, mm -hmm and then have them share. So. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I also did one of the circumference books. Um, so this one is about counting by tens, and so they're having a party and there's too many people and then they can't like count how many people there are, so they have to organize everyone into like the different groups, so then they have like 90, 900, and then like 9,000. Um, so the standards I'm using, um, so a digit in one place um, is like 10 times bigger than like the next digit or what, yeah. And then um, for history, I was thinking about like determining a region um, by like the culture and like, so they're looking at different, um, like what they're wearing and like the fact that there's a king and then there's knights um, and like the tent and like those kinds of things. Um, and then for English, I did um, identify and explain reasons that a speaker provides. So like, what, so I'm kind of looking at like this, where it's like 9, 90, 900, and 9,000. So like how like those connect in like providing the reasons for that. So, yeah. Excellent. Can we also say how appropriate for the times? There's too many people. We gotta group them <laughs> up. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, it's awesome, thank you. <laughs> So my book is about time. The title of it is The Time Book, A Brief History of Lunar Calendars to Atomic Clocks. So there's actually 10 chapters, so it would be a lot of content in 45 minutes. But um, I got my math content from the first chapter. So the standard would be about time and how to add in and subtract intervals of time. and. It really goes through a lot of the history of clocks, and so I wanted to uh, specifically point out uh, the chapter five um, about Mayans. So that's a fifth grade um, standard for like the culture of Mayans. So they give good pictures and description of the Mayan civilization. And then my English standard was being able to, there's a lot of content in these and content words that they need to define and describe that I would have them look up. But um, the extension would be like, they can read more about it. You can even do a science standard about lunar calendars, like the moon, how you can um, tell time from the moon. So there's a lot from it, but those are the main things to tell time. Great, as you're sitting down, Maya, you can come up. The just an interesting piece of information. The Mayan number system is one of the only vertical number systems out there. Uh, they had one of the first descriptions of zero. But also, on one of my trips to Mexico, I was talking to just a gentleman. We just were talking about everything, including mathematics. And I asked him if they ever learned Mayan mathematics. And he said there are several independent states in Mexico where up through grade two, they teach Mayan math still. Oh. How crazy is that? It has not been a number system that's been used with any um, large groups of people except in that area, but they still teach it to this day. So it's worth, we, if you took principles of mathematics one, which I don't think that you did, 
but we talk about it in there. It's fascinating. So anyway, just another tidbit of information. Thank you, Brianna. So my book is How Tall, How Short, How Far Away. And so it's a measuring book. Um, and it starts out um, with like questions like, how tall are you? And just different like measuring things. How far away is your house from school? And then it talks about like the Egyptian measuring system. So um, I said I would like have the students like measure their desk using either the digit, which is uh, the width of one finger, or the palm, the span, or the cubit, which is your elbow to your hand, and measure their desks that way um, as like a little bit of practice. And um, for like uh, their homework, I would have them do and for the extension, um, research some of the ways that Egyptians used these measuring systems to make uh, the large structures that they were able to make, like pyramids. And then um, it talks about our measuring systems as well and conversions between those. So we have the customary system and the metric system. And um, it kind of goes into the conversions between that. And so um, we're teaching, uh, this is a fifth grade standard, um, doing conversions between inches, feet, yards, and then miles. Um, and then uh, the, I used um, the English standard of like using multimedia resources to like get a big idea of the content. So yeah, so that is how I use this book. Excellent, thank you. As she's sitting down, I just want to say I used this in eighth grade. We worked through it. And a couple pieces of fun information. The ruler, uh, the measurements early on were actually made from the ruler of the country, like the person in charge. So what a fun connection to why we call our ruler a ruler. The standard unit of measure was on the leader of the country, and now we just call it a ruler. I don't know. Great connection. I'd have him write a story about it. All right. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Excellent book. All right. So my oh, book yeah. is called Wild Fibonacci. Mm -hmm. So I would probably <laughs> present this. I was thinking like ninth grade algebra one when they get into like sequences and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would probably like be talking about functions and explicitly defined functions first. And then we'd move into like more recursively defined functions. So that's where the Fibonacci would come in. So this book is actually, it's kind of interactive. So they just have like some fun facts at the beginning where it talks about like the guy who came up with the Fibonacci sequence. And then they also talk about nature, how like if you like grab pine needles, like they'll come in clusters of one, two, three, or five, eight, you know, continue up through the sequence. Um, and besides uh, that, they have also this spiral. So another thing I would do while reading this is ask them, what, what's like happening with these boxes? Like, what is the meaning of this spiral? How are they finding it? So then the rest of the book is actually just kind of a pattern of they're just counting up the Fibonacci sequence. But a lot of the animals they chose have like tusks or trunks or something that'll like follow that spiral. Um, so it's kind of... Um, basically a predictive uh, book with like a pattern. So the standards uh, for math is obviously the sequence and recursive functions. Um, I was also thinking for uh, the language arts standard, uh, being able to come up with the main idea and draw conclusions. So at the end of the book, I would ask, you know, if you could write a sequel or write the next couple pages, what would that be? Which it's pretty predictable as you go through, it's just moving up the sequence. And then I ask, well, do we need a sequel or a sequel? Like, can we get the like main picture of this in a shorter like notation or something like that? And then kind of transition into um, basically writing a recursively defined function. So then the last standard that I would talk about is uh, it was an environmental science standard uh, talking about wildlife and basically like species preservation and stuff like that. Uh, so a lot of times like flower petals, they're like the Fibonacci sequence is how like they f like form their petals because mm -hmm. that's actually the way that maximizes the light for photosynthesis. So I would have students maybe as homework from the night before bring in like a plant like a flower or pine cone or something like that and we would look at how 
the Fibonacci sequence can be seen with whatever they bring in and then uh, talk about why that's important for that plant to survive. Awesome, great connections. The book I chose is called A Walk in London, and I enjoyed it because I learned a lot of fun facts just about the culture there, and um, the social studies standard that I could use for fifth graders is how British culture influences our American culture. There's a lot of similarities, but also some differences that students could um, pick out from the, from the book. But I mostly picked this book because there is a lot of math included, specifically on units of measure that they use to find the length, height, and capacity of different um, monuments, um, different museums, cars um, throughout the city. So I'll explain one real quick. It says, Christopher Wren designed the monument to stand 202 feet high because it is 202 feet east of the bakery in Pudding Lane where the great fire started. So there's a lot of historical elements in the book that students would be interested in, and it could also align with what they are learning in their social studies class as well. So I could maybe speak with the social studies teacher, and it could be interdisciplinary, so they could use it in both classrooms. So those are the math and the social studies standards. And then English, um, I focused on specifically the academic language that they can pick out, and it's very content specific, so um, it's very much so the units of measure aspect of it. You don't really find um, like height and weight and other content, so that's very much for math. So that's what I used. Very good book. Excellent. I am not familiar with that book, but I sort of want to read it now. Thank you, Ashley. Hello. <laughs> ah, I forgot my book today. Uh, it's all right. It was sitting on my floor in my room, but that's all right. <laughs> so I got Hidden Figures, oh. um, which is Oh my gosh. <laughs> Which was made into a award winning film. Uh -huh. um, and it is about the four black women who got basically us to the moon uh, during the space race. And so just within um, the content of the book, there's a huge historical uh, presence in it. So this would definitely align to social studies. Um, you could talk about the space race or you could talk about um, which would be appropriate for this year. Uh, just race and equality mm -hmm. and everything that goes into um, just all that. And then uh, it's very physics-based. Um, they don't go super into the mathematics, but because they're trying to get a shuttle to the moon, I mean, there's definitely physics involved with that. And so I think this would be a good um, tie-in into that. And then this would be a good starting point, um, introduction into functions. And you could show examples of like the mathematic functions that would have gotten them to the moon, and then you could just be like, all right, here's the very beginning of this. And so I think this would be good, like, eighth grade or ninth grade um, mathematics, like, introduction for functions. Excellent. Oh, wait, actually, just started watching that movie a couple days ago. Again, she loves it. She loves the book. I love the book. They have all kinds of versions of it. This is more the almost, like, picture book version. Then there's the novel. There's a junior novel, all of it. Um, just a Quick, funny, if this were a calculus problem, I would probably be on that space shuttle, right? Remember the trajectories and people? <laughs> Do you remember my story about my calculus teacher? Anytime I w there was a roller coaster or something falling off the track, he would use my name. Yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, so don't do that. I'm going to say that Isaac kind of stole my thunder because my book is really similar to his. It's called A Computer oh. Called Catherine. <laughs> so it's the story about Catherine Johnson and how she helped get Apollo 11 to the moon. Um, and it was, as Isaac said, during the time where people were fighting for equal rights. So it has a really good social studies connection there. And also good, I guess, good connections for like what you're learning in your science classroom. Also, um, if you're talking about like space, this might be a good time to connect it with mm -hmm. mathematics. So. Um, yeah, it basically just goes through the early childhood, like the early life of Katherine Johnson, how much she loved math, and then it just progresses on into the point where she gets into NASA. And um, one of the standards I chose is that she, um, a social studies sta standard that she helped influence her national government. And um, it's nice because at the end of this book, there's a timeline of like all the different accomplishments she made, and then like all the resulting things after that. Like she had a um, Women's Equality Day. Um, placed on her birthday by 
the United States, and then she also got the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015. So there's a lot of different social studies applications to this, as well as science and math. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent job, all of you. I really hope you wrote down the names of those books and you're walking away with additional ideas, uh, things you could use in your classroom. Please, please, please don't assume that because you're in middle school or high school that your students do not want you to read to you, to them. <laughs> they do. They enjoy it. Make it part of what you do. It doesn't have to be every day. And if you don't have time to do it every day, I get it. But read to them. Show them they can learn from books. It doesn't end because they got out of elementary school, all right? Keep using it. Interdisciplinary, when my first year of teaching, they sent us, and I say us, there was one, they were moving to teams, and I was going to be on this team, and they sent us specifically to this training up in Solon, Ohio, which is one of the wealthiest school districts ever. Uh, so we got to see their schools, how they do things near the Cleveland area. And we went to an interdisciplinary unit training. So it was the math, the language arts, the science, and the social studies teacher. There were four of us that went. And we learned to write interdisciplinary units. It was one of the most horrific trainings I've been part of in my life. The people were like drill sergeants. We'd say, is this a good idea? No, that doesn't work. And we'd be like, oh, no, OK, OK. We'd go back and we'd try again. How about this? No, that's not what we mean. It was so awful. There were schools that left the training. They refused to stay. They couldn't get something that <laughs> trainers said would work. Anyway, we did find a topic. And we did ours on, this is um, something you can also consider. We did ours on um, sort of like Mayan, Mayan math, those kinds of things. Um, we wrote an inter interdisciplinary unit around Sun Watch, which is a local um, ancient civilization place here. It's about an hour and a half away from here. Uh, our students absolutely loved everything about it. They were engaged in the mathematics. They couldn't wait to read more because the language arts and the social studies teachers were working together, what they were reading, what they were writing about, what they were studying. It was so interconnected. My math was about... Um, those things as well. They went, they tried out some of the things that we had, like they were trying to shoot their bows at a certain trajectory to get it to go for, anyway, it was awesome. So it can be done, but if you can't incorporate other teachers, I think, Ashley, you were saying you would like to work with other teachers. If you cannot, if your school system doesn't allow, please think of how you can do that just in your own class because the interest is definitely higher. All right, so lots of books. You have eight books. Um, you're walking away with, so make sure you write those down as resources to use in your future classes. Don't forget to turn in your lesson plans to me today also. Okay, we're going to move on into our chapter 12 pieces for the rest of our time. Uh, last Thursday, we had just started into chapter 12. You had already given me some of the things that stood out to you, but I want to leave the next few minutes for us to finish. I know we didn't finish that piece. So the things that stood out to you as you read through chapter 12, as you looked at the different pieces of algebra, algebraic concepts, were there things left that you wanted to bring up or ask a question about that we did not visit on Thursday? So that's what we'll do now. filling activity which we did in class I I really like that because like it even made us think we were like oh wait that doesn't make sense oh wait that does make sense so I feel like that's like a good like challenge almost for the students absolutely and, like, and then having them make their own shape or so what did we, we do I just had you draw it or see yeah, if you could yeah, yeah. yeah to try to make sense of it so the bottle filling that is loaded on Canvas, if you want to use those, but you also have the example from your book, um, just different graphs. How, would it, how could this happen? Can it happen? Can it not happen? 
what kind of bottle would it have to be, make them draw their own, create their own something, but it's definitely getting them to think through what does it look like to fill a bottle, right? Um, awesome. Isaac. Uh, page 233, there's the uh, example of using the balls and their weights and like just figuring out what their weights have to be. And that reminds me of like the Facebook posts where it's a bunch of like pictures that have s specific values and then you get comments of people who just have no idea how to do math. And so I feel like those, I think that'd be fun to do in the classroom, but like have relevant examples where like instead of just having like random values assigned to like someone's shoes, like what is the weight of football? Absolutely. Anytime we can do real context, right? What makes a good math problem? Context, re relevance is one of them. Um, but that brings up a good point. So I have several of those Facebook go around printed off and sometimes I show them and we do them. But some of those are not just can, can you not use algebraic reasoning, right, to figure out the missing values. Some of those are, did you notice that in one of them there was no shoelaces? And in this one she had pigtails instead of a ponytail? And did, Like, come on. I, no, I didn't notice that because I wasn't looking at every single tiny, but I mean, you can use those for your students um, and have fun discussion, but not on Facebook to make them feel stupid. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't even want to answer those things. So it's like, I'm sure there's a piece here that I'm forgetting. And then they'll be like, look at the math teacher. She can't even do it. I don't want that. So just um, use them with caution, <laughs> use them with caution. But reality, the real weights of things seems to make so much more sense to me, right? And it also would reinforce the balance. You brought the balance in last week. It would reinforce that each side, if we say they're equal, we mean it's the same even if it looks different. So we, it would reinforce the understanding of an equal sign and it would give them a context. So excellent, thank you for pointing that out. Other pieces, yeah. Um, last semester I observed a classroom on Zoom and they did that like at every beginning of class for math. So it's an easy way to do it on Zoom. Like if you have different examples, you could do it with fractions using like a whole pizza and like half of a pizza and that is equal to. But yeah, she did that at the beginning of each class. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, start for a lesson. But yeah, it was really cool and it got them to Absolutely. Great. Great ideas for starting your class. I wonder if you could even do it more fun, like actually take items, like try to, I don't know, make it relevant. All right, other things that stood out to you, things you want to point out from the chapter. Yes, Ashley. Bottom of 248 and the top of 249. The book was kind of brief on it, but the difference between zero slope and no slope, I know yes. that's confusing to do it. Yes. Um, Okay, this goes back to one of those things where you were probably or are probably at the point where you just memorized which was which, zero slope and no slope, yes? Okay, so kind of like when I get to proportions, I just know I cross multiply and divide, that's just what I do. And then when I actually ask you to dig in and figure it out, you're like, wait, why do I do that? How does this? So the same thing, whenever you can give it context, whenever you can show why, your students have a greater chance of remembering it longer with fewer mistakes. Okay, so um, great ideas here. They have number stories. Remember, number stories actually help students make sense of things, <laughs> not just show the algorithmic explanation or um, example, but a number story to help them make sense of the zero or no slope. Did we talk in here even um, just the simple representation of, did we talk about the difference of those two things in here? Remember, how do I, how can I represent that? What, what can I say it's equal to? And what do I say this is equal to? Undefined. Undefined. All right, can we talk through why? I know you just know it, that's just what it is, but you have to teach this to someone maybe soon. Maya? If, so you already have zero and you're dividing it into three, um, you just still have zero? Or, yeah. <laughs> I don't 
But so that logic, I think, can fall short. Because I can say, well, if I have zero and I'm putting it in three groups, I have zero. But if, I've ha if I have three and I'm putting zero in the groups, then why don't I have three? Or why don't I have zero? Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that kind of logic can fall short. I might just, then I get tripped up. Well, which one is it? And then I just memorize. Anytime there's a zero in the denominator, it's undefined. Do you know what I, like, I don't, I want to skip that if possible. You could maybe think of division as the inverse operation of multiplication, like zero times three gets you zero, but zero times what would get you three if you don't have a number that would satisfy that. So our inverse operations become very important to us, right? Can I represent it in more than one way? Do you remember when we were working through our negatives and we had context for working with positive? How do I know if it's going to be positive? How do I know if it's going to be negative? We worked through that. And for the division pieces, the way we worked through it was we turned each division into its true multiplication representative. All right, so if we can show these things early on, help them make the connection. So you're going to be relying on your early childhood educators. I'm helping you out with that. <laughs> and then you go to your middle school. If we can show division with its multiplication representation, then all of a sudden this makes sense. I don't only have to memorize. Now, enough of these, and might my students come up with their own rule? Well, it looks like every single time there's a zero in the denominator, I can't get an answer. There's nothing that, let them come up with that themselves. Instead of you just saying, hey, anytime there's a zero in the denominator. Um, this concept can carry over into zero slope, no slope, you at least have a representation to start with that can aid in how do I set up the context. Okay, excellent. Other things that stood out from chapter 12? Some of these things we're actually covering also in our topics class. And did anybody notice that probability came back? All right, so teaching your students to reason, I'm, I'm sorry, proportional, not probability, to reason proportionally also aids in discovery of patterns, which is an algebraic concept. Anything else? Every page of my chapter has at least one thing highlighted, underlined, or starred. I don't know if yours does as well. Graph going, like going away from just using a calculator, but like if they just look at any graph, they should be able to tell if it's going to match it up. Yes. Put it in a context, right? That's why bottle filling is such a great idea. But any graph they see, they should be able to tell a story. Why don't we start with the story and have them graph it with no numbers? What about our numberless number stories, right? Or what about we start with the graph, no numbers, then you tell the story. So either of those, vice versa, make sense of it before you then plug in numbers and then have them calculate something with it. So the sense making, the reasoning. This is why algebraic reasoning is a topic, not just can you solve this algebraic equation. All right, so the reasoning. Absolutely, yes, show us um, that. So on page 244, they do like, they talk about the sequences more um, and how you would, you could basically use tiles and kind of, you know, set up, okay, this would be like phase one, we'd have like two squares and a trapezoid. And maybe in phase two, you'd have four squares and three trapezoids. And then like you have them predict. So I kind of liked um, in particular that B option on that page with the color tiles because you have very different shapes going on here. Mm -hmm. And so you could get into like multivariate functions and maybe talk about like a 3D graph where you'd have along one axis like you're incrementing up by the sequence. And then the next graph can, like the next axis can show like how many of this shape and then how many of this shape. So you're like, you'd have like X and Y so you could do like with different variables and this is like a very concrete way to represent something like that that would be like way out there. But like it would give them an introduction 
Um, I want to see you represent that 3D graph. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just I'm just teasing. Yes. So we have CMC has this. I have some as well. Most schools in the early childhood will have things like this available for you. Um, you can even get just squares. You don't even have to get the varied shapes. You can get just squares in all those colors. So that's something you can order. Um, they're just multicolored tiles instead of multicolored shapes. So you just would order it differently. Um, they're not all that expensive, but they provide so much that we can do. Much like these that I handed out today, except you're varying the color. So now my pattern doesn't just have to be by shape. It can also be two characteristics at the same time. How do I define it? Can I define it? Can I find the next term? Can I find the 15th? Can I find the nth? Now I have a way to do a concrete example. All right. Excellent. And those are easy. You can also make them yourself. All right. You can print them out. So if your district doesn't have funds for you to purchase, if you don't have the funds to purchase, um, you can make them. All right. You know, much like I made the positive negative chips that I put in a really safe place that nobody knows where it is. So <sighs> you can make your own. Okay. Uh, thank you. So now you have two different manipulatives already from Chapter 12. Isaac brought in the scale with positive negative, and Alona showed us how we could use shapes and colors in our concrete examples of patterns. Anything else that stood out to you from this chapter? Ben. Kind of like how they um, established like using a number line to help students like understand what variables are. So like. They use an example of n plus 3 equals n, they draw like a number line on it where it's like um, you have like, like just helping students visualize like what, what is going on with their Can you tell me what page number you're on? Uh, 237. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting concept to um, think about with number lines. Number lines students start seeing very early on, right? Uh, even in preschool, number lines are common. Here's oftentimes what number lines leave out, which I don't ever want you to be guilty of this. They often leave out zero. I think we talked about this when we were doing fractions, right, on a number line. Number lines often leave out zero for early, early childhood or even before kindergarten. Uh, because we don't count with zero, oftentimes our number lines only represent counting numbers. So make sure if you're going to use a number line example, you always include zero. And whether you're putting positives and negatives or just positives, always leave the option for negative numbers. Always leave the option for negative numbers. Okay? Whether there should be some space after your zero that indicates something else does exist. All right? Number line is infinite. Here's another thing to consider when you're using number lines. If you're going to have students draw them on their own, their increments might not be equal. Equal increments are kind of key. It's what helps the picture, the concrete, of the abstract. Okay, so if they're going to draw their own, give them some kind of a tool to make equal increments. The third thing to consider is that in early childhood, when students are first learning numbers, a vertical number line is more intuitive than a horizontal number line. All of a sudden, on a vertical number line, zero makes a whole lot more sense because I'm standing on zero. Do you know what I mean? On a horizontal number line, the zero is way more abstract to me. Okay, so consider using a vertical number line. And I can also imagine going up being greater and going down being less. That is way more intuitively known on a vertical number line than a horizontal number line. Now let's talk about developmental. We break away from vertical number lines fairly early on. Oftentimes teachers quit with vertical number lines in first grade. But what if you've got a fourth or fifth grader coming to you developmentally never grasped the idea of greater than, less than with regard to zero, right? Because zero is a hard concept for some students. Why not have the option of vertical or horizontal representations? All right, so don't be against it. Don't think they should be past that by now. Instead, think, how do I meet them where they are to move them forward? Think about our 16-year-olds in eighth grade who haven't passed a class since third, fourth, or fifth. 
maybe they would take advantage or really learn from the vertical number line. So excellent point, but know the history and the developmental process of a number line and how it can be used differently. Okay. Other things. There really is so much in this chapter. I don't think it would be possible for us to cover everything. Um, we're not going to try. I want you to look at page 223 with me. I get the sense in here that none of us are going to have difficulty teaching our students to solve equations. That's not typically the problem, all right? When I was teaching eighth grade, I had students, I was on the inclusion team, so we had students um, that were identified with special education needs and on our team, and we were the only one, there were three teams in the eighth grade, we were the only one that had the students that needed inclusion, the inclusion intervention specialist was on our team, et cetera. I had a student whose IQ was extremely low um, in mainstream classes, all right, and I even was able to teach her to solve two-step equations with nearly 100% accuracy by memorizing steps and using repetition. All right? She could do it. Could she make sense of it in a number story? Not so much. But could she solve the equation? Yes. Could she find out what x was? Yes. Could she find out what x and y were in the same equation? Yes. All right? What we're asking you to do is to move beyond that. Help your students not just solve an equation, but think algebraically. So when you look at page 223, algebraic thinking, there are three things here. And I want you to know these three things, all right? I don't ask you to memorize much, but I want you to know these three things. Number one, when you think about algebra, please think that it is the study of structures in the number system including those arising in arithmetic. A shortened phrase would simply be to think of algebra as generalized arithmetic. Now, I talk a lot in here, I remind you a lot, to go back to what the students have learned previously. We have to know, what do they already know? What have they been doing and how can I build on it? Well, if you think of algebra as generalizing arithmetic, all of a sudden we're way back to what they started in kindergarten. We're back to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. We're just now giving it a different purpose, all right? Okay, that's the first. Number two, the study of patterns, relations, and functions. If our students can see patterns in numbers, all of a sudden they can make connections that they may never have made before. If everything we teach seems like something new, and not something connected what they had previous knowledge on, they are less likely to remember. They're more likely to be one of the 90% polled on the street, or 80% polled on the street, who think two-fourths is greater than one-half. Because that was a new piece of information, I just had to memorize that, and now I have forgotten. I haven't been taught to make sense or to look for patterns. All right? So teach them to look for patterns. Did I give you that statistic in here? We don't want those students, or we don't want our students to be those people who had to learn everything individually without making connections, because then they're more likely to forget. Okay, the last one. Think of algebra as the process of mathematical modeling. Now we'll talk about this in just a minute. Including the meaningful use of symbols. Now I've said tons of times in here, our K2 number one strategy is modeling. Our three to five number one strategy is uh, relationships, patterns, and functions, okay? Then we get into middle school. They're saying here, think of algebra as all of that. How can I model it? How can I make generalizations? How can I look at functions? How can I find patterns? Algebra is pulling all of it together. Build on what they know, bring the previous into the current, and teach them to reason algebraically not just solve an equation, all right? That's what we're after. 
not just solve an equation. So I loved, loved teaching algebra. It was my favorite. I loved it because it was so step by step. You can't go wrong. If you do this, this always happens, right? But after a couple years of teaching that way, I realized all I'm doing is producing students who can get the answer. Can they make any sense of it? Do they know what it means? Changed the way I taught. I went more to context-based instead of just solve all these problems. And my students were much better equipped to think algebraically, not just get the answer. I want us to teach that way, all right? You can still love algebra. And yes, though I did make you prove that you could answer a question with more than one right answer, there really is usually only one right answer. Um, but teach them to think it through. Why is that the answer? What would I have to do to this context to get a different answer? All right? OK, thinking algebraically. We're going to continue with algebraic ideals. But I would like for you now to look at your, um, they're called algeb algebits. <laughs> there are algebra tiles you can use. But I have just brought today some algebits. So whatever. They wanted to make money outside of the algebra tiles, so they called them something else. That's really all it is. That's, that's all it is, but we're going to use it today because that's what I have in my storehouse, OK? So if you'll open your packages, your purple pieces have x on them. Your blue pieces are considered your units, OK, or not tied to a variable. And right now, I just want you to play with them for a little bit. Just look at them. While you're doing that, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. If you're going to use manipulatives in your class, please do not put them out on the desk and expect your students to not play with them, to not create with them. Um, you can't say, leave them alone and listen to all my instructions, because guess what? They're still going to play with them, and they're not going to listen to your instructions. Then you're going to give your instructions, and then guess what you're going to have to do? Give them again. OK, so let them play. Just like we're, we're just playing. Okay. They're fun. Look, we're making patterns. It's so fun. They're colorful. If you're in a classroom with no carpet, the entire time you use these, you're going to hear ting, 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 ting. Okay, you just got to be okay with it. All right. Okay, now <laughs> let me talk to you about this Algebits program. This is pre algebra. This is geared for students fourth, fifth, sixth, kind of. I think it actually says third grade in here, except third grade, they're still working on properties. They're not quite ready for what this is asking you to do. Oftentimes in here, I'll say, um, use this, and then you'll ask, but how would you use it? What would it look like? Is this just one day? Is this a whole unit? Those kinds of things. So this is designed in 16 lessons to be progressive. In other words, you start with lesson one, you work up through lesson 16. It might be one lesson a day. You might need more than that. Okay, You might need two days for a couple of these. Or you might say, man, lessons one, two, and three, done. My students had enough previous knowledge on the pre-assessment. We didn't need to spend time. Okay, But it is meant to lay a foundation of thinking algebraically, not just to solve equations. All right, So we're going to do a couple of the tasks. All right, so. You would explain to them, first of all, what a variable is, what units are. Now, we've talked about different vocabulary strategies. Would I just tell them? Is that, is that the best way to do vocabulary? A variable is, and then I give you the definition, what do you think? I think maybe we'll find, like, tell you what they think it is. Yes. Represent it. Model it. What do you think it is? All right. You're also in class with Dr. Sylvester, and I'm sure she has told you by now that telling students the meaning of the words is the least effective vocabulary teaching strategy. The least effective. However, it is probably the most highly utilized. What in the world? We can do better than that. If research tells us they don't learn that way, then why do we keep doing it? Right? Efficient is only efficient 
if you understand. I've used that phrase in here before. So just being efficient, I'm just going to tell them what it means. It's not efficient if they don't actually understand. So no, you don't just tell them this is what a variable is. Model it, show it. I'm telling you x is a variable. What might I mean by that? Okay. Are there any other variables? How would you define it? Can you show me those kinds of things? Have those conversations. How many of you have heard that word before? Who's used that word before? How many of you have an older brother or sister who talks about variables? Has anybody ever heard algebra is all about letters used for numbers? Bring those things up, okay? Ellie and Micah both have told me they know algebra because A is 1, B is 2. They've both said this. Isn't that fascinating? Did either any of you, I should say, think that ever? Right, okay. My mother-in-law said to me, I never in a million years could figure out why they used letters in math. And she graduated from high school. It was never explained. She just knew to find the answer. Help them figure out what a variable is. Don't just tell them. Okay? All right. So lesson number one, define variable. <laughs> So you've read about it. What is a variable? You tell me. Oh no, you're afraid to answer. <laughs> Victoria, don't be afraid. <laughs> what is a variable? You're going to teach this one day. It's okay. Try it. What would you say? What is a variable? What do you think, Alana? Um, in some contexts, it's like a placeholder for a number of value that's not random. Absolutely. Can I say this? A variable can be a placeholder for a number of value that's unknown. Okay. Um, any other ideas? What is a variable? Isaac. A placeholder for potentially an infinite amount of Okay, now you might have to define infinite also, but yeah, it can be a placeholder for a potentially infinite amount of number or values. Anything else? A variable? Yes, sir. Can you like help show a relationship between numbers? A variable can help show relationships between numbers. Absolutely. So we would continue like this, and you would give them examples, all right? And in the chapter, you learned that a variable doesn't just mean a number that can change. If that's all we ever tell our students, then when we do a simple number sentence like this, and we tell them or have told them that a variable is a number that can change, all of a sudden, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because what is x? Can it be anything else? No. It can't really change. There's only one value for it. So this is when it would be most appropriate for them to derive that it's holding a place for an, for an unknown currently value, right? But then there are other times when I just want a relationship, or I want to show a pattern, or I want something that varies dependent upon the situation, I would show them and challenge them with different um, scenarios. For today's lesson with algebits, we're going to use this understanding. Okay? So, lesson one, what's a variable? How do I use it? Okay, here's what I would like for us to do. And you too can use algebits if you go through the training sessions. You're actually not even supposed to use it. I got this from someone else, another professor who retired, and she said, actually, I don't know if you went through the training, so I'm not allowed if you're, I don't know if you're allowed to use them. Talk about having a corner on the market. I, this is what we need to be working on, folks. What can you invent that's like something else, but you give it a new name, and then you make people pay for your training? Because that's where the money is, all right? I'm just saying. There we go. That's what you should do. I should get, I should, I mean, what if I just made them different? I'm just kidding. Here we go. Um, all right, so it's progressive. We're building one right after the, one right after the other. You want to start with what is a variable. I would like for you now to just put two of the x values and three of the unit values on your table. Set the others aside right now. And then all I would have you do at this point, if you were my students in my, uh, let's say, fourth grade class, 
is write out possible values for this. What could it possibly be? Anybody have an idea? What could the value of two x's and three units be? Are the variables or the multiplication? They're the variables. Oh, then these are the symbols like multiplication? Those are the units, like um, just your whole numbers. So they're all whole numbers. It can be whole numbers. Or? Symbols? Not symbols. So definitely numbers, but they could be whole, they could be half, they could be less, more irrational. You tell me, what could it equal? Alona? Could equal five. How could it equal five? Well, if the x is a place older than one, then you could have five. This is where you start. What else could it be? Um. Maya? Uh, seven. How could it be seven? If x is a placeholder for two. If x is a placeholder for two, then I have two plus two plus three is, okay? This is where you start. Play around with it. What could it be? What do you notice? What do you wonder? What question could you ask? Could you challenge Maya? I don't see how in the world it could be seven. This is where you start, all right? Get them to dig in, figure out the different representations. What could it possibly be? Then we move on and you start giving them some things it has to be. Okay, so now I want you to use your two x's and put in four units. And I'm going to tell you the value. The value is 62. Now I would like for you to tell me what is x holding the place of. So I told you the value is 62. Now you have to tell me what is x holding the place of. Yes. Like, okay, that's what I thought. Yep. So they're not units for one. Yes. And in this, I probably should have said, so in algebras, they represent because I can also say they're two, or I could also say they're three, but in this case, they're one. I'm saying they're just units. We will, you can move into same symbol. They could be all two. They could be all, but in this case, we're counting them so as just one. If they're one, then all of them have to be one. Yes. If they're two, all of them. Yes. Yes. And then, what are the symbols? Write no symbols I yet. Like that. But they're they're coming. <laughs> there are 16 lessons. Oh. We're just at lesson two. Oh. <laughs> they're coming. Okay, We're so making all sense of it. And Actually, right now I think it's just addition. Okay. Well, yeah, because to solve it you're gonna have to do that. But yeah. Oh, okay. I know. We're just. Mm -hmm. This is fourth grade, what? not eighth grade. This is stretching. <laughs> This is where they are in fourth grade, though. They're not yet ready for all the symbols and the parentheses and the adds and the multiplies and putting it on the outside just means multiply. They're not there yet. We're getting them there. Okay. All right, so this is kind of the progression. So if I tell you it's 62, what is x holding the value of? Yeah. Prove it to so me. We have x 29 times 2 is 58 plus 4. Do we have agreement? Do we have any disagreement? Do we have any challenges? Right? Do we have any other ways of doing it or other ways of explaining it? Yeah. Did you say the value is 62, right? 62. Okay, so I did 62 minus 4, and I got 58, and then I divided that by 2 and got 29. So that's a different explanation from what? Ben gave us. Do I allow that? Do we want that in our class? Absolutely. In fact, that's why these lessons take more time. Because how did you think of it? What did you do? Can you write it? Can you model it? Can you show it? Are there any challenges? Is it possible it could have been something else? All right, that's all part of your questioning. All right, next lesson. 
I would like for you to have two collections. One with two X's and three units. And one with one X and five units. Now I'm going to say <laughs> no. Okay. They're not equal. Not yet, but that's coming. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to say if the total value of the combined collections is 53, what is the value of the variable? What do you think, Ashley? Okay, how did you get 15? So the combined value of the two sets is 53, so I first subtracted all the blue tiles from 53 and got 45, and then I had three variables remaining, so I divided 45 by 3 and got 15. Okay, any other ways of doing it? I would just add, which was assumed in what Ashley said, that you were adding the two groups together. Okay. What made you assume that we were adding the two groups together? Well, from what Ashley said, we were already taking away the eight okay. blue tiles. And so that assumes that we added the two groups together to get okay. the eight blue tiles. Can anybody think of one of the words I used that made you think you needed to add them, Alona? Yeah, the combination of the two groups. So now I've introduced I can add more than one variable together. Okay. Do you see how we're starting to, to build on concepts? There are no symbols yet. Mm -hmm. There are no symbols yet. We'll get there. We will then turn these into written number sentences with variables, with units, with multiplication. Because what if I say now, put two x's, three units, and I want you to double So first model it, two x's and three units, now double it. So on the table or with my students, I would expect to see either two groups of two x's and three units, or some of you may already have combined them and have four x's and six units. Yes? Okay, so we're just starting the need for symbols. We're starting to work through it. What does it mean? Do I only double my x's? Do I also double my units? Now think about distributive property. Think about what you're doing. By modeling, you're moving into some of these concepts without even using symbols yet. Okay? I'm just going to name some of the next. Next, you're going to perform operations on the collections, like doubling, like having them, like tripling them. Okay? Then we'll move into comparing sizes of collections. Which is greater? What if one has more x's but less units and the other has more units but less x's? How do I compare that? What are the questions? I probably should know the value. So it starts to beg these questions. It gets students asking questions themselves. What information do they need from the teacher in order to do what you've asked them to do? The questioning, the reasoning, the modeling. Then we get into can you turn this into a number sentence? What would this model look like on paper? Okay, that's when we introduce symbols. Is it possible that I need to redefine my symbols in order to answer some of the questions? Pose that to your students, give them an example where it has to be true. All right? This is how you can progress from introducing algebraic concepts to writing number sentences and equations. All right, this lesson 16 ends with applying equations and inequalities to solving problems. So we do this modeling and we get into, now if I have a context, what does it look like? All right, progression. I will say Algebits is one progressive way to teach from beginning through 
uh, algebraic reasoning concepts in number stories, but there are other examples of this as well. It's not just this, this is one method. How can I use a model to get them where they need to be, all right? Questions you have, and there's a whole lot more in this, and you are more than welcome to borrow this if you end up teaching algebra, but are there questions that you have? All right, for sake of time, we're going to put this one away. So the strategy from today is really just using manipulatives to model and build conceptual understanding. That's the strategy, the teaching strategy, is use of manipulatives. While you're putting those back in your bags, and don't worry about giving me your bags yet, just stick them back in there, I'm going to introduce the next strategy by playing a video for you. You may be ready, um, but I know many of you don't, and we're going to try them together in a minute. The way they work is, in a classroom, you would ask students to work out a problem mentally in their heads, without written work, without writing, um, and when they answer the problem, students are asked to just put up their thumb. No hands, because um, when students are putting their hands up, as soon as they're finished, it's intimidating for people who haven't finished. Um, I'm going to just show you the way a number talk is introduced, just the first piece now with the use of thumbs. So this was a number talk that Kathy Humphreys gave to our elementary teacher at Stanford. And we're just going to watch the beginning here to see how a number talk is started. Okay, so on this card there are some shapes. And when I put the card up, I'd like you to figure out how many there are without counting one by one. So take a quick glimpse of them. And when, you're, when you do think you know how many there are, put your thumb up. So before we watch a couple of different number talks, I want to try some of the mathematical ideas we use together. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is just simply to write down the answer without using pen and paper. Uh, try not to use a, the traditional algorithm, but work out and write down the answer for 18 times 5. Okay. Number talks. So we're going to talk about this in just a minute. This video, you can watch the whole thing. Do you remember me telling you ucubed.org is an excellent resource? This is from Ucubed. This is Joe Bowler. She's the creator of Ucubed. Do you know Joe Bowler? Have, but her stuff, it's great. I, why not? I'm just kidding. I wish I could have a talk with her. This is also the website where I said, be careful with some of the things you watch. I definitely think we have different starting points, OK? Um, and by that, I mean I start from creation by a creator, right? Um, I don't start at zero. And I also start from there is truth, and I can know truth. All right, so some of what you'll find on the YouCube site doesn't start from the same place. So always keep that in mind. Always have that critical thought with your biblical perspective always in everything you watch. That being said, the math that comes out of this um, ucube.org and subsequent courses and things you can take is excellent, okay? Number talks. You saw a teacher just, I'm gonna show a card and I want you to count them without actually, get, okay, so number talk. How do we get students started? How do we draw interest? How do we get buy-in? And how can I possibly motivate an unmotivated student, right? Okay. Here you go, 18 times 5. How many of you could do it fairly quickly? Okay. Anybody need a little bit more time? Like, wait. Anybody going through their head? Okay, wait, I've got to carry. Anybody doing that? Anybody carry? Okay. All right. All right. She asked you not to use traditional algorithm, but how many of you have a hard time thinking outside of traditional algorithm? Okay, because traditional algorithm is just get the answer. And your teachers thought that was the most efficient way to do it. All right. Um, nothing wrong with that. I'm just asking you to think in addition to those algorithms. All right. You don't have to throw them out the window. There's a place for everything. But how else could we do it? Rebecca, how did you do it? And then I'll go to Maya. We did it two ways. First way. Um, where you line them up 
18 is 5 in my head, and then 5 times 8, which is 40. So you have a 1, 5 times 1 is 5, plus 1. I didn't do Did that. you carry the 1? What did I you carried carry? the 4. <laughs> oh, joy. Um, but or you could do 5 times 10, which is 50, plus 5 times 8, which is 40, and then I just said. Maya, how'd you do it? Five times twelve is sixty, and then six times five is thirty, and then sixty plus thirty is ninety. <laughs> five times twelve? Why twelve? That's the highest one I know off the top of my head. <laughs> also? That's what I did, but then I added. <laughs> <laughs> I did twelve times five, and then I added five and six off of that. And you counted by five <laughs> this way. Ben? I did 20 times 5 is 100, and then 18 times 5 is 10 less than that, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ways. Any more ways? There are only 8 of us in here. Did you do it differently, too? Yeah. There's also, you could, like, divide the 18 by 2 and multiply the 5 by 2, so you'd have 9 times 10. 6 ways with 8 people. Anybody else? Not 12, but then I counted up by fives. <laughs> okay, that's seven. Any others? I'm a five times ten, five times eight person. Seven different ways to do this in our head with only eight people in the classroom, folks. Are your middle school classrooms going to have eight people in them? Most likely not. I mean, maybe now with COVID where they have the, I don't know. But y most likely not, okay? If you're in a public school setting, how many students are you going to expect in your classrooms? 300, right? No, like 20 to 30, right? It's going to feel like 300. Um, how many ways are there going to be then? Think about doing a number talk with 25 to 30 students. If seven of you, if eight of you came up with seven ways, right? Now, what also does this then mean? Why am I just teaching one way of doing it? Why am I not allowing for all these other ways? If they're doing it anyway, why not teach it? Open it up. Make it part of a number talk. Make the learning come from the students, right? Community of learners, everybody shares, everybody learns together, not just from the one person, like the teacher. OK, number talks. We're going to use a version of number talks, and I'm going to give you so this is, so number talk is a strategy, write that down, we've been learning different strategies in here, number talk is a strategy. A piece of a number talk strategy is task cards. Now, sometimes task cards can be their own strategy, sometimes task cards come with a number talk because you use the card itself to um, promote the talk, okay? So uh, if you're taking notes on the different strategies, which you should, um, think of them as either together or can be used separately. All right, so I'm going to escape out of here. I would encourage you to watch this entire video because the information in here on how to design a number talk and watching different number talks, and then you can see students actually give their input is very beneficial. It's already loaded for you on your Canvas page. All right, and with that, we're going to go. This is also from Ucube. This is from uh, Joe Bowler and others wrote an algebra unit it's a four-week unit meant to be an introduction into algebraic thinking and we're going to use week one days three four and five are right here there's i mean it, it has a whole lot more but we're going to do the number talk piece of this all right you've got your cubes linking cubes look at task card a so if I were truly doing this in my classroom, I know you asked that, how would you do this in your classroom? This is what I would do. I would have cut these out separately, but for the sake of time in here, we don't have three days to do each of these tasks. We're doing them in 15 minutes. I would have cut each of these out separately, and each task card would have been its own number talk that we would have done over the course of these three days, okay? That's how it would work in a classroom. Today, we're just going to dip our hand in and give it a try. All right? So task card A. Notice case 1, case 2, case 3, case 4, case 5. I would like 
for you to play around with what you think case 6, case 7, case 8, case 9, case 10 would look like. So you've got your cubes. You can use those. You could draw it out. You also have whiteboards. All right, Victoria didn't want to stop at 10. She's going further. <laughs> it's kind of fun when you start playing around with it, right? Like, what, what could it be? So now I want you to look at each other's. What does it look like? Did we do something similar? Do we have discrepancies? Are there things we need to change? What are we noticing? Did the same, same? Can you guys see what's happening? Oh, and you drew it after that? Oh, you did too? Okay. Okay, so part of my number talk, some of the questions I would ask might be, how do you see the shapes change as the case number increases? Remember in topic, so Alona, you weren't there for this discussion, we did a T chart, yes? Term number, sequence number. So in this case, on our task card, we're not calling it a term number, we're calling it a case number, okay? Make sure your students are familiar with the language, and if you don't want to use case, remember you have a computer and you can recreate this and say term if you think that will trip up your students. We don't just have to use what's provided. Okay, so you would ask those kinds of questions. Um, where do you see, right, look at this, where do you see the new squares? How do you see the shapes change as the case number decreases? What would the 15th case look like? What would the negative three case look like? So not only can you move it forward, but can you back it up? Remember, um, actually Ben brought up the number line, but remember our patterns need to be taught as infinite. One of our restrictions is our pages. We cannot show an infinite pattern because we're restricted by space, right? So ask the students, help them wonder, let them talk it out. Good? All right, let's look at um, task card B, and then this is where we might stop for today. I would like for you to recreate task card B, either with your cubes or on your whiteboard. You can pick. And then I would like for you to do case 5, 6, and 7. so small. <laughs> so as you look around, if you're my students in my middle school pre-algebra classroom, we're checking out each other's patterns, we're looking at how they're the same and different, we're asking and answering these questions that have already been provided. We're doing this either one each day or a couple in one setting. But then I also might say things like this. Why might I not ask you to create case 25? What would be your answer? Why might I not do that? How many cubes would be in case 25? Would that take a lot of space? Yeah. Might they not fit on your desk? Mm -hmm. So ask students, why might I not? Why would I never ask you to create case 1,000? Mm -hmm. So what you want students to notice is, at some point, my model will begin to fail me. Now I'm making a case, if you will, for why I need to look at defining my pattern and maybe even looking at what is the algorithmic definition, right? 
So you start with these, you ask them the, these questions, you get them wondering, then you provide the rationale for why we move away from modeling and into other representations. Number talks serve to get students to buy in, to discuss their thought process, and then to give you what you need to move to the next thing. By me asking you these questions and having you talk them through, now you're more ready for why we need to write a rule for this. I can't ask you to show case 1000. It would, I mean, you're going to have students who want to, and maybe if you have time, let them do it. But it's going to take a while. And then the other students who are like, I don't want to write that. I already know case 1000 has 1000 cubes because I'm looking at the relationship between the case number and the cube number. I already know. I don't have to make a thousand of them. Right? You provide rationale for the rule. You move them on. Algebraic thinking. All right. Again, I've loaded the, mm, yes. U cubed is loaded in Canvas. So you can look at the entire, I'll just scroll up a little bit so you can see kind of how this is designed. Oh, wait. That, I rotated the one. <laughs> I'll just leave it. Look at all this wonderful <laughs> information. It actually writes up what your days would look like and the tasks you would have them do. All right, so the strategy here is number talk where we will use task cards. But remember, these strategies can be used separately. All right? We also used with this manipulatives in our number talk. And you can do that as well, but you don't have to. As we're wrapping up today, I'm going to assign your chapter 12 assessment. All right? Isn't that fun? Don't you want one of these? Look, I just didn't cut them out for you. You can have your own. <laughs> this is going to serve as your chapter 12 assessment. All right? Here's what I want you to do with this. This is, oops, our last strategy of the day. The strategy is think dots, and it can be used uh, for any content area. All right, we're just going to do one for mathematics, specifically algebraic reasoning. Okay, if you'll take one and pass, I'll take two for the boys. I have each of the levels of blooms written on a dot uh, for a cube. Okay. What you would eventually do is cut this out, fold it and tape it and make a cube. Look, it's also a net. We could, uh, so many fun things we could do. You would turn it into a cube. In class Thursday though, when you bring this back to me, I'm going to bring a big cube that will roll and, nope, I brought it today. I'm bringing it back on Thursday. We're going to then use what you've created and actually roll the cube. But this is how it will work, okay? You're going to take the concepts that you've been talking about and working through from chapter 12, algebraic reasoning, and create. Something like this. For each of the levels of blooms, now think about a number talk. What kind of questions do I start with? Think about what we did with algebits. Where do I begin? What comes next? Think of this like a progression, all right? If I want to work on the meaningful use of symbols, which is one of the components of algebraic reasoning, what should I start with at a remembering level? What should I move on into the next level? What should I move on? What am I going to ask them to create on their own? So that's what I want you to think through. One of the algebraic reasoning concepts, and then the progression, but you're using the progression with blooms, OK? And we've already worked with blooms in here. So here's how it would look. For instance, on my remembering, so my one dot. I might say something like A, B, C, and D represent a different value. If A equals 4, find B, C, and D. That would be a remembering. That would be just plug it in. Like a, do I remember how to do that? Okay. The second step, the understanding, I might say something like explain the mathematical reasoning involved with that task. Just a little bit better. Okay, so I can do that. It's kind of basic. It's, it's the solve. It's the get, the answer. But what do I need to know to do that? That would be my understanding. My application part might be, describe how a variable can be used in mathematics in more than one way. 
We even talked about that in class today. Is it just a placeholder? Is it showing a relationship? Does it truly vary? Okay, and then give an example of that. That would be your description with the application because you provide the example. All right, then we move to analyze. Given that AX equals 15, explain how X changes if A is large or if A is small in value. Okay, the reason this is analyzed is I'm looking at how things change and I'm making sense of that. Then I get to evaluate and I say diagram or model how to solve and then I give an equation. Now, the evaluative piece of this is not, I just didn't ask you to get the answer. I asked you to do something with it to diagram or model how you would solve it. Don't just get the answer. And then finally, under creation, create an interesting number story that is modeled by, and then I give you something similar to your evaluation, and I've asked you to create something along with it. Okay, then I did ask you to solve it. This is the example I created. I have loaded this for you in Canvas as an example. You can model. You can also look, because the strategy is called Think Dots, you can also look up examples online if you need a little bit more. But I am asking that you create your own using concepts from Chapter 12, concepts from algebraic reasoning and thinking. Maybe it's a pattern. Maybe all six levels are about a specific pattern or types of patterns. Maybe it's about an algebraic property. All right. Maybe it's developing the meaningful use of symbols. Maybe it is back to proportional reasoning found within algebraic reasoning. So many concepts that were brought up in Chapter 12 that you could use. But what I'm asking is that you use this strategy of think dots to work them through the levels of blooms, six different tasks, if you will, and then when you bring it to class today, we're going to play, okay? So you'll have your tasks. You don't have to write them on your cube. I just did that so you'll remember what think dots are, okay? Yours is going to look more like this. But what we'll do is we'll say, okay, for Victoria's, we'll roll this. Let's say it lands on the two. We do her task two, okay? And then we'll do one for, so everybody will get a chance for us to do one of your six tasks in class so you can see how to use the strategy of think dots in a classroom setting. Do you have any questions for me as we close out? Do you know what I'm asking you to do? Bring it with you Thursday. Yes, so in preparation for Thursday, you're supposed to read chapter 13, but also bring this chapter 12 assessment with you, all right? I will collect it as an assessment when we're done rolling and answering. Okay, who has chapter 13 manipulatives? Go ahead and bring those to class Thursday. If you forget, we can carry over to the following Tuesday. Ashley. This assessment, do you want us to have answered our own questions as well or just? I don't want you to put the answers on this that you bring with you because then it will take away our fun. But I want you to, um, yeah, have answered them, just not in what you show us. Great question. Anything else for me? All right, if you would just pile maybe all of your supplies on one table, it will just make up, and I'll see you Thursday. <laughs>